Hi everyone and welcome to the Autistica webinar series. Um, my name is Dr Michelle Newman and I'm a research fellow here at Autistica. Um, I'm very excited to be leading this lunchtime webinar um, where we're going to be discussing the barriers autistic people face when finding work and how recruitment and workplaces can be more neuroinclusive. Um, for those of you who are new to us, Autistica is the UK's leading research charity. Um, we exist to create breakthroughs that enable people, um, all autistic people, to live happier, healthier, longer lives. Um, how do we do that, you might ask? Well, we work with autistic people, we fund research, and we shape policy to make sure that the evidence that's generated through that research um, has real world impact. Um, and a big part of that is sharing that research and the latest evidence-based practice publicly, which is what these webinars are all about. And so without much further ado, I'm going to hand over to Mel. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, everyone, for being here. I really appreciate you joining this webinar over your lunch break if you are having lunch at the moment. Um, I hope it's exciting. So uh, my name is Mel Romualdis. I'm an assistant professor and an autism researcher at UCL's Institute of Education. Um, I am based in the Department of Psychology and Human Development, and I also work at the Center for Research in Autism and Education, which is my research affiliation. So um, I'm part of CRAE, and I am delighted to be here today and delivering this Autistica webinar. And now over to my co-presenter, Rose. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Rose Matthews and I'm an autistic autism researcher and I'm really delighted to be here today to add a kind of lived experience angle to what Mel's going to talk about. Great, so the way this webinar is gonna to go today is that I'm going to talk for maybe 15 to 20 minutes and then Rose will speak. And then we're going to have about 15 minutes, I think at the end of the hour to answer any questions that you as audience members might have. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. And does that look okay, Rose? Great. Okay. So today we're going to be talking about leveling the employment playing field and how we can make specifically hiring processes and the recruitment process more inclusive, but also workplaces in general. And just a note on language before I get into the meat of this talk, um, I will be using identity first language, so autistic person rather than person with autism. And that's because there are a number of studies that have shown us that this is the preferred um, language that is preferred by the majority of autistic people and community stakeholders. I will be avoiding any deficit-based language. I will be referring to autism, not autism spectrum disorder. Um, and I will avoid using any terms such as lack, inability, deficit, et cetera. Um, and we at Cray and you know, throughout this webinar, we will be talking through the neurodiversity perspective, which is just the belief that autism is a neurotype. It is as natural to diversity um, as in, you know, other neurotypes, like neurotypical people, um, and that it is not a disorder or an illness or a condition. It is a neurotype. So just a few stats on autism and employment or a little bit of a background on this. Um, I think it's becoming common knowledge that there is a bit of an unemployment crisis for autistic adults in the UK. Um, this off-cited statistic from the Office for National Statistics is that only 22% of autistic adults in the UK are in some form of paid work. But I just want to say that this statistic may be inaccurate. And that's because we know that many autistic people who work don't disclose that they're autistic. So the real figure may not um, be anywhere close to this, but this is the number that we have currently. But what we do know for sure is that autistic adults who want to work have described barriers to both finding and maintaining employment. So for those who are successful at obtaining employment and are able to sustain employment for a long period of time, they still might experience burnout um, because the workplaces just aren't set up to be inclusive. Um, so over time, though they are able to maintain that employment, it may lead to burnout and other mental health issues such as anxiety and depression. 
So as I said, workplace environments just are not inclusive places most of the time. And some organizational cultures just do not recognize or value neurodiversity. Rather, they value everyone doing things the same or you know, working in an environment that might not be suitable for all types of workers. And when we're talking about recruitment and hiring processes, there are so many barriers for autistic people to enter the world of work. For example, Online applications can be lengthy and confusing, and there isn't any support available. You know, if you're struggling through an online application, the language is ambiguous, you're not quite sure how to complete this form, um, what support is available at this stage of the recruitment process. There's also been research that has shown that assessment centers, such as, you know, all job candidates being asked to come to a place and take a um, variety of tests, uh, and also group-based assessments can present difficulties for autistic candidates. I think we talk about job interviews quite a bit because job interviews rely so heavily on impression management and social cues. Um, you know, often autistic people can struggle with that and they are discriminated against because of social characteristics that might not fit neurotypical expectations. So job interviews can be such a huge barrier for autistic people who are autistic job seekers. And they also create situations that are both ambiguous and unpredictable. For example, there can be a lot of uncertainty about getting to the location of the interview, uncertainty about the physical space in which the interview is going to take place. You know, is it going to be too cold or too hot? Is there going to be a lot of um, noise, that background noise that is distracting, et cetera? Also, you know, job candidates who are invited to interview aren't necessarily familiar with the social conventions and practices that might be unique to certain organizations. Like if it's a more casual workplace, do you shake hands? Um, just one example of some of the ambiguities that can arise from job interview situations. And when we're talking about recruitment and hiring processes, I feel like I have to mention disclosure because this is something that a lot of people struggle with. You know, I've spoken to a lot of autistic people who struggle with the question of whether or not they should tell potential employers that they are autistic. On the one hand, this might allow them to gauge whether an organization is the right fit for them, if they're willing to make those kinds of adjustments for them if they do get the job. But on the other hand, there's always that risk where, you know, if you disclose that you're autistic, when applying for a job, you might be discriminated against. And some people just don't have the luxury of, you know, waiting until they find the right fit. Sometimes people need to find a job now. There have been a few studies that have focused on perceptions of autistic job candidates when they disclose their diagnosis during an interview. However, um, a study that we published in 2021 showed that this was not actually when most autistic people chose to disclose during the recruitment process. In fact, the most common time was either on the application or after starting the job. But a study conducted in the United States sadly showed that candidates who disclosed a disability in the initial stages of recruitment, such as in a cover letter, on the application form, or on a CV, were 26% less likely to be shortlisted. Now, I mentioned that this was conducted in the, in the United States because here in the UK, we have something called the Guaranteed Interview Scheme, that if you disclose a disability, you're guaranteed an interview. Unfortunately, um, I've heard too many stories from autistic people who say that they feel that employers use that as a, um, a way to find out um, about people's disabilities and discriminate against them anyway. They might guarantee an interview, but they won't go any further than that in the recruitment process. I mentioned that after starting the job was a very common time point for disclosure. And a narrative that I heard over and over when you know, speaking to autistic people about their disclosure experiences was what we like to term retrospective disclosure. So it basically means disclosure after a negative experience on the job or a string of negative experiences where disclosure becomes a necessity rather than a choice. You know, someone, an autistic person is forced to disclose that they're autistic because they've been struggling at work, because they need adjustments, because they've been discriminated against, and they felt that telling people they were autistic would increase understanding and acceptance from the people they worked with. So knowing all this, knowing that recruitment can be so 
difficult and present so many barriers for autistic people, what can we do? If you're an employer listening in today, what can you do if you want to hire more neurodivergent people to your organization? I'm basing these recommendations on an excellent piece of autistic funded employment research by Jay Davies and colleagues, which was published just earlier this year. And one of these is that recruitment methods should test practical job skills. Oftentimes employers base so much on the job interview when wouldn't it make more sense to actually see if that candidate can do the job? You know, maybe give them a trial period of a few days where they're actually asked to do what the job entails. Or, you know, the interview process might, for example, um, ask them to do something in front of the employer that is related to the job directly, rather than just talking about themselves in an interview. Another way of making hiring processes more inclusive is to just make them more flexible. And you know, to have that flexibility to tailor them to individual needs. Like if a candidate needs a little bit more time to answer, you know, an assessment or like complete an assessment, then give them that. And this is another one. Job specifications should actually be specific. Oftentimes, you know, especially in this paper, they found that a lot of job specifications can actually use very unclear, ambiguous language. For example, you know, this candidate should be a team player. But what does that really mean? Wouldn't it be better to use clear language like this candidate would be willing to take on more responsibilities if other team members are unavailable? So small adjustments like that can make the hiring process so much more inclusive. And just in general, more information in advance can benefit everyone really. Um, you know, I talked about the uncertainty of the job interview situation, the uncertainty of what the physical space will look like, who they're going to meet with, not knowing who the people are that, they're, that are interviewing them. But you can provide that information in advance to your job candidates. You can give them a packet that has a picture of the exterior and the interior of the building, for example, instructions on how to get there, um, maybe even you know, pictures of the people who are going to interview them, a little bit of information about those interviewers, et cetera. You can even provide the interview questions in advance, which so many people have said helps them so much when preparing for interviews. And if you feel as an employer that this is unfair, I'm going to say something radical here, why not do it for everyone? Everyone would benefit from this adjustment. Also consider the environment within which the interview or the candidate testing was taking place. And that refers to both the sensory environment and the social environment. The sensory environment can be really triggering. You know, if the temperature is fluctuating or if it's too extreme, if there's a lot of background noise, those are things to consider when bringing in neurodivergent job candidates. And the social environment is related to, you know, who are the people that they're meeting with? Can you give them more information about that? And can you stick to that? I also wanted to talk a little bit about how we can make workplaces in general more inclusive for autistic people. So getting the job is just the first part. What about you know, creating an inclusive workplace environment that makes all employees able to do their job to the best of their ability? I've already spoken about inclusive recruitment and application processes, but there should also be better disclosure protocols and support. You know, disclosure can be such a difficult decision and many autistic people can struggle with that decision. When they finally do decide to disclose, something should come about that benefits them. So there needs to be a clear way for them to do that, to disclose safely, and also receive the support they need once they have disclosed to colleagues. Oftentimes disclosure can be followed by adjustments. You know, a lot of people, tell their managers that they're autistic so that they can receive some adjustments in the workplace. But if those adjustments aren't timely, and if they're not appropriate, they're not good adjustments. So there needs to be follow through and evaluation when it comes to this. You know, I spoke to one of my autistic participants who said it took them six months just to get an appropriate chair for them to be able to do their job. And this is something that is not okay and shouldn't be happening. If someone needs adjustments, they should get them. And of course, you know, the pandemic has taught us that flexible work hours and the option to work remotely do work. Um, and this should be offered to autistic people. 
and I've spoken a lot about the sensory environment. Workplace environments should minimize sensory overload. I don't think anyone likes open plan workspaces. Um, a lot of chatter, a lot of atmospheric noise, et cetera. You know, bright, harsh lights, for example, is something to consider when employing autistic people. And again, there should be more predictability, more clarity in communication and a clear hierarchy. You know, if you struggle, if you have a problem with something, who do you go to first? Um, who is your first port of call? And this is a big one. Just we need to increase the knowledge and understanding of autism for employers and colleagues. And just to end my part of the webinar, I have a few recommendations, just three big recommendations to take away. And the first is related to what I've just said, which is to improve the understanding of autism among staff. But doing general autism training just isn't enough. What we really need is to develop an understanding of what each individual employee needs to thrive and to flourish. Again, I'm going to just emphasize that adjustments need to be timely, appropriate, and evaluated regularly. And also take steps to change the culture of the workplace. If you create an environment where adjustments are the norm rather than, than the exception and hiring managers are willing to support their employees with, with whatever they need, the result is that you have created an environment where everyone is thriving, everyone is flourishing, and everyone can do their jobs well. And as an employer, that's all you really want. Thank you so much um, to Autistica, to my department, and to Cray, and all of you for listening. If anyone wants to contact me, my Twitter, LinkedIn, and my email address are all on this screen. Um, I do have references in case anyone is interested in that. I'm completely willing to send the slides out after this webinar. But for now, um, I'm going to hand it over to my brilliant colleague, Rose. Hi, everyone. So just a little bit about me, because I think it's really important to be open about uh, what in research terms we call positionality, who we are. So I'm white British, um, she, they, brought up as, as uh, female, but increasingly identifying as non-binary. I was diagnosed autistic when I was 58, nearly 59, and I'm 63 now. So um, I've actually had a 40 plus year employment history, most of which was experienced without the knowledge that I was in fact autistic. I've worked across public, private and third sector organisations at quite a senior level. I've been employed and self-employed and um, done all kinds of, of different kinds of roles. Part of my career track record is having done quite a lot of work on recruitment, um, careers and employability for graduates, for people with long term mental health issues. Um, and in various different contexts. Um, I'll be drawing on my own lived experience, my, my wider experience of autistic people's um, perspectives from my networks and research and my family, several generations of, of, of whom um, their career experiences make a lot of sense through the lens of autism. So these days, <clears throat> I am a researcher, a consultant and an activist, because basically when you're 63 years old, um, you begin to get a bit impatient for change and research tends to have a very, very long pipeline for our findings to actually begin to make a difference. So I'm actually getting out there and working with organisations and employers and trying to change things on the ground based on what we already know. Could I have the next slide, Mel, thanks. So as Mel has indicated, um, recruitment processes can be a bit of a minefield. Now, whenever I do um, an employment webinar with Mel, I seem to end up applying for other jobs um, because I have a kind of portfolio of, of, of multiple part-time roles. And I can confirm from the experience of the last week that it is an inherently confusing process. There are often quite hidden agendas. There's no set approach. Job descriptions and person specs can be really cryptic and it can be extraordinarily onerous. I mean, two roles I applied for within the last week, one to be on a public sector body and one <clears throat> a temporary and part time research role. I reckon they, they took me. It, I mean, it was a, more than a full day's work for each of those. And my previous career history can be seen as a bit of a problem because I've actually had more than 45 jobs. Now, 
for a lot of people in HR, that's that's going to actually send up some kind of warning signals and red, red flags. And they're going to think, what is the problem with this person that they've had so many jobs? And actually, the problem isn't to do with me. The problem is to do with the lack of adaptations and accommodations for autistic people in workplaces. And so what I got very good at was doing jobs a bit like projects, staying in them for as long as I could, delivering whatever I could and then moving on. And it actually meant that my career advanced quite successfully, but it was extremely exhausting. And sometimes I just longed to stay put. And when you're being selected, you're often being selected for things like perceived likability and sociability. So, you know, we're having to mask and role play in a lot of situations because the whole process is assessing things that are actually quite irrelevant to doing the job. And, and there are hidden traps. I mean, personally speaking, I have never succeeded in being shortlisted when there has been a psychometric test. And I've had some other really nasty surprises like unseen tests on the day of the interview, um, just being handed a sheaf full of data and being told, here you go, tell us what that says. I mean, it's, 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 it's really appalling sometimes that you're tested on things that have nothing whatsoever to do with the way that you would actually do the job. And I think that my autistic strengths have actually also been a great asset to me because I can become extremely focused on applying for a role I can do very in-depth research. I can come up with very innovative, creative ideas about solutions for that role or organization. And I've actually had a very good success rate of converting job interviews and recruitment processes into job offers. It hasn't always been a good idea to accept those offers, but I'll come back to that later. Next slide, please, Mel. Now, I think that um, Mel has already touched on lots of aspects of, of what might make an environment um, for a face to face recruitment process challenging for an autistic person. And I endorse everything that she said about noise, lighting, sound. For me, it includes smells. Um, there's all kinds of things. Temperature. Yes, Mel mentioned that. So there's all kinds of things that are going to make it more difficult for me to perform well in interview conditions. And it goes wider than just the sensory things, of course. And this model, which is fantastic, which has been developed by Autistic Doctors International for healthcare settings, they're now adapting it for employment settings. So they've got this wonderful acronym of SPACE, which is attending to sensory, predictability, acceptance, communication, and empathy issues. And then the PPE is looking at physical issues, processing issues and emotional issues. And I would highly recommend that you have a look at this. I mean, obviously, the model now is for healthcare, but it will give you some really good insights if you work in healthcare. And even if you don't, you can yourself translate some of what's being said to other contexts and think about, OK, I'm setting up a recruitment process and it's going to be face to face. How can I make this more accessible? in the ways that Mel described earlier. Next slide, please, Mel. And I, I completely endorse what Mel said about, it's not just about recruitment, it's not just about interviews and um, being appointing more neurodivergent people into job roles. It is about enabling us to survive and thrive and achieve seniority because then we're better able to influence and shape the future of employment from within. Um, and a lot of um, autistic people in employment, which included me up until the age of nearly 59, we haven't been diagnosed as autistic. We haven't even self-identified as autistic. So in order that processes and workplaces are truly inclusive, we really do need to address issues at an environmental and structural level, rather than relying on people to identify themselves and have specific accommodations made for them. And the only caveat about that is, you know, you can put in, in place a lot of um, structural and environmental issues that will in general terms better suit neurodivergent people. However, we are all different. And if you're going for a one size fits all approach, it's likely to fit nobody. So, 
it's also important that roles are tailored to meet individual requirements. And this means that you need to make it safe for people to openly discuss their needs in a way that is then acted on rather than being tokenistic. Because I can say from experience of myself and others that there's nothing worse than being asked what we need in order to thrive at work and then being told for whatever reason, it's just not feasible to provide it, when we can see that it very obviously is. So it's a, it's a combination of adjustments and accommodations at the individual level and at the wider structural level so that people aren't forced to disclose because it isn't always safe to disclose. And some people experience additional disadvantages, sources of prejudice and stigma, that make it even more difficult for them to disclose. So we've got to be mindful of that. Next slide, please, Mel. Now, a phrase that you might well hear talked about in terms of autistic people at work is that we're often the canaries, because in the same way that canaries used to be used in, in coal mines to detect toxicity, when the canary started to show distress, then the miners knew that the air was unbreathable. Autistic people in a dysfunctional or a toxic workplace often experience distress um, and start suffering earlier than their colleagues. So this is why Ludmila Preslova, who's also a very um, late diagnosed autistic person, a psychologist by background came up with this idea of the canary code. So how, how do we make workplaces more inclusive? Now, I wouldn't usually show a diagram like this because there's a lot of text on it, but I wanted to, to give you at least a glimpse of it and I'll talk you through it and it will be available on the slides. Now, what Ludmilla says is it's so important that everything that happens here is participatory because if you're somebody who isn't neurodivergent, you won't experience the same challenges and barriers. You won't even necessarily see them. So you, you need to do this work with neurodivergent autistic people. And there should be a strong outcome focus. So like, what are we looking to do here? What is this process about? What are the outcomes that you want? You need to be very flexible. You need to make it fair. There needs to be justice. There needs to be transparency. And if you're going to measure things, please, please, please use valid measurements, not bad science. So starting down at the bottom towards the um, left there, it starts with realistic job descriptions based on job analysis. And one of the many joys I had in the course of my career was to do something called Hey Job Evaluation Training as part of organizational restructure where we looked at job descriptions to see if they accurately represented what the job was. And it won't surprise you to know that in 99.9% .9 of cases, they didn't. So it's really, really important to make sure that what's described is what people are actually going to be doing so that we don't screen ourselves out by thinking, oh gosh, I couldn't do that or I wouldn't feel comfortable doing the other. We've talked a lot about inclusive recruitment. The selection process needs to be valid, outcomes focused. We need fair compensation and, and to reduce these pay gaps because um, those of us who've had disruptive careers often suffer disproportionately because sometimes salaries are based on previous salary, which may not be a fa fair way of assessing the suitable salary point for that person. And we need viable part-time options. I can't tell you how many times I haven't applied for roles because the employer has said, this role is only available on a full-time basis. And I know myself well enough to know now that I do not want to take on full-time work. So that rules out a lot of opportunities, including with some autism charities, because they will not contemplate anything other than full-time roles. And we need to think about benefit options and different kinds of packages, different kinds of living arrangements and family structures. People need intersectional inclusion training that covers every aspect of, of, of inclusion um, because we're not necessarily just autistic people. We may be physically disabled autistic people, black disabled people, dis black 
autistic people, we've got different aspects for which we may face prejudice and stigma. And the physical environment needs to be supportive and healthy and safe. Because as we've seen with the CBI recently and um, with other organizations, people can be at great risk of harm in some work environments, particularly where lines between the professional and the personal and social and, and, and work-based activities are blurred. This is a very, very difficult area for some autistic people to, to handle. Flexible work. Um, job crafting, I love that term. So I did this before I even knew it was a thing. It's basically where you 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 kind of look at how a job could be adapted and 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 crafted and changed to meet your requirements. And being able to have the confidence to ne negotiate that with an employer is so so important. So I've done a lot of assertiveness training, and I think that you know having good assertiveness skills training for autistic people is really really important. And again, topical in the, and in the news, we need to think about civility at work and anti-bullying mechanisms because very demanding bosses can make life completely miserable for people. And it isn't necessary to be uncivil, um, but it often happens. Um, and we need fair outcomes-based performance measurement and fair de-biased and transparent promotion and representation in leadership and decision making that doesn't rely on people who struggle with managing other people um, having to achieve promotion and seniority beca by becoming people managers instead of doing the things that they excel at and are good at. A lot of autistic people are very effective people managers, but it can also be very exhausting. So it's important that that isn't the only route to seniority. OK, next slide, please, Mel. Now, one of the things that really gives me hope, because I'm I'm the parent of autistic children and an autistic grandchild, and one of the things that really gives me hope is um, seeing better representations of autistic people kind of in the mainstream. And I absolutely loved watching um, A Kind of Spark, um, because it isn't about a pull of them, pity narrative, it isn't an inspirational disabled child overcomes adversity story arc. It's about life as autistic people live it. And um, Caitlin Hamilton said, I was so scared that telling people I was autistic would limit the roles I could audition for. And doing this makes me feel like, yeah, we can. There's no part we can't do. That's so empowering for us. And, you know, I'd say the same from a career perspective. I mean, I was fortunate in a way that when I was younger, I didn't know that I was autistic because I didn't rule myself out of careers that I might have considered unsuitable based on the deficit paradigm that tends to be applied to autism. So I went for it. You know, I was a police officer. I worked in probation. I worked in prisons. I was a mental health social worker and learning disability social worker, a social worker, a social work academic, actually teaching communication skills to social work students. And I'm sure that had it been known that I was autistic, um, when I was young and when I embarked upon my career, I might have felt faced much greater barriers and actually been denied some of those opportunities. OK, next slide, please, Mel. OK, I won't go through all of this because I want to get on to the questions, but I put this slide in really to just summarise some of the practical things that can be done. We've, we've mentioned most of these already. Um, employers and autistic people are not mutually exclusive categories. You know, I think it will be wonderful when more and more people involved in recruitment and appointment are themselves neurodivergent and autistic. Um, I think we need loads more autistic people in HR because HR plays quite a pivotal role at the point of recruitment, at the point of issues occurring in the workplace, and at the point of departure. So I'm a big fan of um, exit interviews, preferably conducted by a third party organization so that people can be really honest about why they're leaving. And this is partly because people need to be protected from serial sexual predators. And um, in my experience, I have seen this occur where somebody has repeatedly targeted people within a work setting and the employer 
has decided to overlook it because that person brings in a massive income and is a high profile figure. And this is completely unacceptable. OK, next slide, please. So the future of work. There's been a massive explosion of opportunities for autistic people. Sadly, some are still unpaid. We're getting targeted by employers because of our specific strengths and skills, but it's important that these are seen as career options for us, not the only available possibilities. Um, employment support is crucial in securing or, and, and retaining employment, but when I've tried to get it, it's always been too little too late. Access to work, brilliant. Can you get it quickly? No. Um, if they come up with recommendations, will your employer, employer implement them? Often not. And being autistic shouldn't mean having to hide it, hack it or hawk it. So in other words, camouflage or disguise autism, have to try and somehow hack autism so that it becomes an advantage to us, or hawk it by making our career out partly out of being autistic. You know, I'm, I'm an expert in a lot of things, not just autistic lived experience. And I don't want to be kind of pigeonholed into having to only ever um, talk about autistic lived experience because I've actually got expertise in lots of other areas. And nor should being autistic mean having to be super talented because again, it's an absolute myth that we all have some exceptional power, exceptional gift. You know, there are people in, in, in maintenance roles, in, in support roles, every single kind of role and all of those roles need to be open to autistic people. And, you know, we shouldn't be forced to somehow perform some kind of party trick in order to be accepted as an autistic person. We really can do anything. And I recommend the article that I've referenced there, hide it, hack it or hawk it. Um, so the next slide, please, Mel. OK, so I um, have had uh, what I would describe as a roller coaster career. And um, it's been very precarious at times. I have been unemployed. I have been underemployed and I have burnt out and had to take extended time to recover. And that burnout has been repeated and um, the cumulative effect grew greater as, as I got older. So that by the time I was in my fifties, and I burnt out, um, I, I really just couldn't get going again. And, and that was to a large extent what, what led me um, to getting an autism diagnosis. Um, I have, I think, been fortunate in being able to kind of have a symbiotic relationship between my personal interests and work. So they've kind of fed off each other. So I've, I've kind of had self-employment, entrepreneurship, solopreneurship opportunities, and challenges, but also opportunities at every career stage. Um, not just paid roles, but, but kind of getting public appointments and doing some voluntary work. Um, but to survive at work and to survive this long in the workplace, I have had to continuously reinvent myself. And as I say, that has been very exhausting. It's affected my income, it's affected my pension provision, and ultimately, it's affected my mental health. Um, and it was really only my autism discovery that led to these light bulb moments when I realized why I had had such a tough time. And I'm very, very motivated um, to work in this area because I don't want future generations to have to go through such a tough time as, as some older generations of autistic people have had to, which includes being shut out of the workplace and not even being able to get started in work in the first place. So I've put my contact details there. If I can help anybody personally or in a wider professional organizational sense, please, please, please do get in touch. Um, so that's my email. I'm at Northly Rose on Twitter and I'm on LinkedIn, although I have to admit, I do hate LinkedIn with a passion, so you won't often find me there. <laughs> but I kind of feel like I ought to be there, but I don't really enjoy it. So thank you so, so much. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what questions have come in.
thank you both ever so much for those really, really interesting um, talks. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some of the questions that have been coming in through both your talks. Um, ahead of this, I just have to apologise. We're having a bit of a crisis at home at the moment. So if my alarm goes off, I can only apologise. Um, but so the first question we've got, I'm going to um, fill this out to you first, Rose. Um, how can I include my neurodiversity in my job application? Well, I can only speak really from, from personal experience of this. Um, I am very careful to only introduce the fact that I'm neurodivergent when I can portray it as a strength and when I'm confident that that's how it's going to be received. So, for example, I've just applied for a national committee and I spoke about my... The, one of the assessment criteria is how successful I've been. So I've explained that everything that I achieved in my career was done without knowing that I was autistic until I was nearly 59, because they need to see my achievements through that lens. Because put aside somebody else, they might say, well, actually, you haven't done as much as X person, but look how I did it. Look at what I did. So I think it's really important to consider, you know, do I actually want to share this and why am I sharing it and what might the outcome be? And sometimes I haven't shared it in the actual application process for the reasons that Mel gave, that it may, even if somebody isn't overtly and consciously biased, they may be unconsciously contra, consciously biased or even protective. Oh, I don't want to put this autistic person into a frontline police role. Oh, it might be too much for them. Do you know what I mean? Kind of paternalistic. And um, I've sometimes blurted out that I'm autistic partway through an interview when somebody asked me a question like, this job involves some repetitive routine work. How will you maintain your focus and avoid getting distracted? I'm autistic. You know, being able to do repetitive tasks and maintain focus and, and keep an eye for detail is, is one of my key strengths. You know, and sometimes I've done that. Um, but I, I, I find it hard to advise because I think I would have to know what the role is, what your background is, what context, but do contact me off, you know, like outside of this, I'd be happy, happy, happy to give you some personal advice on, on that, or even just to kind of talk it through. Thanks, Rose. Mel, did you have anything to add to that? Just to say that having heard so many stories from autistic job seekers that I think it's very similar to what Rose just said, where, you know, they would be hesitant to disclose that they were autistic unless they could portray it as a strength, unless it gave them something that they thought added to their appeal as a candidate. Um, and that's unfortunately, that is the world we live in. Um, you know, it's people don't just take it as like, this person is autistic. Okay. Um, that is where we're at. So I think, yeah, there's very similar experiences that I've heard. So nicely linked with that, we had a question um, that came in about um, if you're disclosing in an interview um, about legal requirements to guarantee an interview. Um, so I'm going to um, pick up this because I have just gone and went and double check this now. Um, Neurodiversity isn't actually one of the protected characteristics, disability is. So if you did tick the disability box, that would come into that. But obviously then we fall into this realms of whether you want to be ticking that box as a disability for all of the reasons that we've talked about that Mel nicely um, picked up at the start of this as well. So yes, um, if you tick that box in your application, then they would legally have to, regardless of whether or not they are a disability confident employer, they would have to offer you um, an interview. Um, so the next question that we did have um, was, bear with me two seconds, I am just locating where it was written. Okay, my, this um, question, sorry, two seconds. This is quite a long one, so I apologise to you both, so I'm going to read this one out to you. Okay, well, I'll find it. Let's ask the next one. So Mel, um, how can we support people who might want to consider self-employment rather than working for an organisation? This is a really interesting one and one that I think um, needs a lot more research into because it seems that many autistic people do feel like entrepreneurship or self-employment are the right path for them. Um, there are a few organisations that offer general career advice specifically for autistic people such as Ambitious about Autism and the National Autistic Society. I think Ambitious, for example, they have a network of career professionals and advisors that you can contact for help with that. Um, but 
just as an aside, I think self-employment actually does seem to be a really nice pathway. Um, you know, one of my master's students did her research on this and spoke to, you know, about 30 autistic people about their experiences, what led them to go into self-employment. Um, so yeah, worth looking into. Do you have anything to add, Rose? Yeah, I mean, you can get access to work support to set up in business as a self-employed person, you need to provide some evidence that you could make a viable income through doing that. So it's important to build up some kind of track record of, of, of getting some consultancy work. And if anybody wants to, I, I saw somebody say in the chat, um, where is this explosion of, of opportunities? If anybody wants to contact me about that, um, then please do, because there, there are increasingly opportunities. But if, you, if you're not quite sure where to look for them and where to find them, you may not see them. Um, so I would say five recent pieces of work that I've done have actually been through Twitter. Um, so, you know, through through a Twitter connection and, and, and through ongoing discussions about that. But um, there, also in your area, if you if you contact the organisation that is responsible for providing post-diagnostic support to autistic adults, they should actually know all the specialist um, organisations. Now, the problem was when I asked for help with the job application two weeks ago, they said that if I was to get help, I would have to give up my three hour a week casual contract, <laughs> which goes on till the year dot in order to be fully unemployed and to qualify for help. So a lot of the problem with a lot of these employment-based support organizations is they're not flexible enough to meet the needs of autistic people who are often underemployed, not just unemployed. So they said, how would you feel about giving up your casual contract? And I said, appalled. <laughs> but then, you know, I'm talking to the commissioners to say, um, you know, what, how can we get some better employment support for autistic people in my area? And going back to activism, we haven't just got to sit back and accept mediocre or substandard services. We can actually advocate for ourselves and put pressure onto the people who are spending the money to spend the money in better ways. So I would, again, encourage people to stick up for your rights. And um, if the services you need aren't there, then flag it up. Well, that's really, really interesting. Um, so this one, I'm going to ask Mel this one first, but um, both feel free to um, offer any insight you've got. So I find this one really interesting as somebody that went through a major career change myself. Um, is there any help or advice with changing careers for autistic people who realise they got the wrong training? I'm sorry, they got training in the wrong field. I'm going to signpost to the same organisations I mentioned before, because I don't know of any support that's specifically for people who want to change careers, just general careers advice. So, you know, just mentioning Ambitious and the National Autistic Society careers guidance that is available. Um, I don't know, Rose, if you know any who really focus on switching careers. Yeah, I think Genius Within would be good on that. I mean, I, I hesitate to just mention Genius Within. I should say other companies are available, but I just happen to know about Genius Within. And, um, Again, you know, it's there are individual consultants, advisors, job coaches, mentors, but you need to make sure you're getting um, a, somebody who's, you know, kind of sound in, in the approach that they're taking. So this, I'm going to move more towards actually being in the jobs. I think a lot of questions we've just answered are about actually getting into employment. So this one, um, Rose, if you don't mind, um, answering this one first um have you got any suggestions about where you might be treated as a nuisance for asking for adjustments oh gosh <laughs> you mean personal examples <laughs> numerous <laughs> i mean um my first experience interestingly enough was around hearing loss because um i was diagnosed with hearing loss high frequency bilateral hearing loss when when i was in my um early 50s um just just after I was 50 and it didn't make sense because my hearing should have been better than the hearing test said it was but it was partly to do with auditory processing as well and I think that is it was very instructive to me realizing just how disruptive it is to ask for adjustments to be made and how employers can struggle with that and at one point I was actually can you believe this I was actually offered some equipment that a, another colleague had been um given for a completely different hearing condition 
and that that colleague had left because the 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 the, the employer hadn't properly accommodated their needs and when access to work came up with what I needed, the employer said, well, actually, you know, rather than buying that, could we just give you this stuff that so-and-so used to use? I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable. And I think that the difficulty is it's, it's fixing the problem on the person and not on the situation. I mean, I was in an open, I was moved. I was excelling in a job. I mean, that sounds immodest, but I was, I, I really was excelling in a job. I was bringing in a lot of money um, and being extremely successful when they moved me from a four person office to an office designed for 16 people. And I simply could not use the phone. The only way I could use the phone was, was, was getting under my desk into the little cubby hole under the desk and sitting under my desk. It, it was farcical. We were adjacent to an industrial area where people were using noisy industrial equipment. Access came to work came and were brilliant but by the time you're bringing in access to work to try and negotiate adjustments with your employer, in my experience, it's almost too late. Because wouldn't an employer that wanted to keep you, wouldn't they really just make those adjustments? And the fact there was an empty room I could have used, why couldn't I? Oh, well, if we do it for you, everybody will want one. You know, why should you be a special case? Because I've got hearing loss. That's why. And so, um, um, you know, but, but do you know what I've done? And this is just a message to anybody out there who's struggling in an organization. You know, it can be an amazing impetus to go off and do something else. I went back into a social care practice role. I thought, OK, I've had enough of academia. I'm not being treated like this. I will not be treated like this. And I went off and I did other things. And I've got a bit of a love hate relationship with academia because when I'm outside it, I always long to be in it. And when I'm in it, I think, oh, my goodness, way to go in becoming inclusive. So, you know, I, th I think that part of the reason for my career success is getting so angry about the way I was treated that it spurred me on to go and prove a point and get a job where I could do well, but also not do myself any harm in the process. Sorry, that was a bit of a rant, but I do feel passionate about it. That was a brilliant answer. <laughs> no, and I think the point that you made earlier in your talk as well um, about it's not just making those adjustments, um, accommodations, it's about doing it quickly and rapidly is, is really, really important. Um, so we've probably got time for maybe one or two last questions. So um, here's one that um, came through. Um, I wish there could be more something done to make adjustments, but I worry that adjustments would be seen as an unfair advantage because of the competitive nature of the arts industry. Um, so I wonder if any of you have any thoughts about um, the perception of people being offered adjustments and how you manage that. I mean, that is a very common experience, I think. And it adds to the discrimination that autistic people face in the workplace. When they do get these adjustments, the colleagues see it as unfair. But, you know, I don't know how to fix this rather other than just changing the attitudes of people and this is I know it's such a huge ask but it has to be done we have to do something to change employers attitudes to change organizational cultures and this is why I think, I think it's so important that it has to come from the top it has to come from organizational leaders they have to create a culture as I mentioned before where this is just seen as just being equitable giving people leveling the playing field which is what we're talking about today you know you're not getting those adjustments because you don't need them in the same way that this person needs them and I just, you know, we have to be targeting people's attitudes about this. Yeah, I mean, to that, I just add wherever possible, give it to everybody, you know, make that adjustment for everybody. I mean, there's that cartoon, isn't there, of, of, of leveling up being people with different sized podiums because it just brings them to the same height. I mean, there is a problem with an invisible disability like being autistic because it isn't obvious why I struggle in certain situations and it isn't obvious why a certain way of doing things would disadvantage me, but that disadvantage is real. And that's why we need to get more autistic people into HR and senior management roles. And, you know, good on autistic for having an autistic chief exec, because the, this is the way we're going to actually change things, um, you know. Uh, 
I'm on mute. I knew that would happen at least once. <laughs> no, we're very fortunate. Um, James does a fantastic job with autistic care, so we're very pleased to be working for him. So um, we are almost at time then. Um, we've got one last question that um, I wanted to direct um, towards both of you. Um, one of our attendees had said that um, their clients have found that disability confident employees at level three are not disability confident when it comes to autism. There is still incompetence, and I would disagree that they are at level three if they do not understand neurodivergence. There needs to be an extra assessment done. What do you think about this? I could not agree more with that. I think that, um, first of all, when we talk about disability and diversity and inclusion, oftentimes maybe, maybe it's changing now, but I think that just recently it's begun to change where neurodiversity is included in that definition and in that conversation. It has to be in the conversation. Um, but I think putting in an extra assessment is a brilliant idea because yes, there are so many employers that just don't have the understanding, they don't have the competence and they don't have the knowledge. And just, you know, maybe it's not available to them. Maybe um, it's unclear where they can get that knowledge, but there needs to be something to kind of change the understanding of autism. Just on a wider scale. Yeah, and I just add to that, that that, that knowledge and, and, and that perspective needs to be multidimensional because there's a danger of some, some employers bringing one autistic person who might be white, male, advantaged, educated. And then I actually got told by one employer, um, you know, oh, we've had autism training and this is what you need. Well, well, no, actually, you have no idea what I need. <laughs> you have a general idea about autism inclusivity from one person's perspective. And, you know, the really interesting thing in that scenario was they weren't asking their autistic staff to be involved. So if I was running an organization, the first people I would go to would be my neurodivergent staff and get any external training consultants to work with the autistic and neurodivergent staff who want to be involved but to be shut out from that process and like, you're not an expert, this person's the expert. And it's because it's more comfortable because if they bring in somebody from outside, they don't know the stuff that's happening behind the scenes. It's, it's, it's much less challenging for an organization to simply run a little talk. Okay, tick the box, we've done that. If you actually were to ask your staff what the experience of working for the organization is like as a neurodivergent person, and that's why things like annual surveys, things that trade unions do are so, so, so important. It doesn't leave the individual exposed. It allows patterns and trends and issues, like I mentioned earlier, um, with particular harms being done by particular individuals to be outed in a way that doesn't put individual people at risk. There's a... Um one of the projects I'm working on, one of the people. So all of our research is very much tapping into that, you know, you need to have autistic people involved in research about autism. Um, and one of our um, people that are involved in that said, you've, if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. And I think that's exactly the point that you're saying. Um, so I'm afraid that that is all we've got time for today. Um, but thank you so much, everybody, for joining us and for your questions. Um, hopefully they have um, been able to dig deeper into some of those questions, some of the material that um, our speakers have been sharing with us and just to basically help us understand a little bit more. Um, I'd also like to thank um, my colleague, Mercedes, who has been supporting our webinar today in the background as well, um, who you haven't seen, but has been feverishly answering messages um, in the background. Um, on our website, you can and sign up to hear about our future webinars and our latest research in autism research um, and the work that we're doing on employment. Um, and you can also have a look at how you can get involved in some of that work or the wider work that we're doing. Um, all that's left for me to say is a huge thank you to Mel and Rose for sharing their experiences and their work with us today and for answering all of our audience questions so thoughtfully. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you both with us. Um, I've really enjoyed talking to it, um, listening to this. I'm going to go back and listen to it all again, I think, because I'm certainly missing some information um but that's it for today and we really hope you'll join us all again very soon at another event thank you